Hello there, everybody. Um, my name is Alex Bovey, and I'm coming to you from my study in Streatham Hill in London, England. Now you, Fern. Oh, I missed my cue there. And hello, um, I'm Fern. I'm in West London in Old Acton Town. So Fern and I are uh, hosting this evening's Open Court Old Hour, and uh, it's a real joy to welcome you into our homes and, uh, and to share tonight's discussion about the future of art history with you. Um, some of you are welcoming back. We've um, had a great audience for the first two Open Court Told Hours that we've done. Both of these are available online now. And um, we were just planning four, but it's been such a pleasure to do them that we're plotting more for the month of June and even more for October, but I really shouldn't say anything about that. Um, and so tonight's theme uh, comes to us while uh, we're in the midst, is needless to say, of a global pandemic and, and also um, a global pand pandemic that intersects with a project that we've had at the Courtauld really going, I think, in development and, and in an active sense for the past four or five years, uh, Courtauld Connects. And that project is really all about the, the future of the Courtauld Institute and the future of art history and how we envisage it. And it's been an, an intense project um, and uh, it ongoing. But I think we might look back in some nostalgia at uh, the kinds of expectations that we had about the future of art history, even just a few weeks ago. Um, and so uh, tonight's conversation about the future of art history uh, takes on board the, the kind of new and um, pretty unexpected context that we have all estranged from original works of art, uh, estranged from one another, but united uh, on screen and in spirit. So Fern, um, over to you. Great, uh, thank you Alex. So yeah, uh, I'm Fern. I'm the Research Forum Program Manager. Uh, my job entails thinking about ways to engage audiences with art history. So my time is split between thinking about this on a very local level for our academic colleagues and students. And then there's the other part, thinking about how to make court old research available to a wider audience. Now, what motivates me to do this is a belief that art history is misunderstood. It's often perceived as highbrow and for a very specific audience who are in the know. But that's just not the case, I don't think, because using the tools that are taught in art history all just lead to understanding how to better interpret what you see, to make you question why you are being shown something and what the motive behind its presentation is. And that's something that everyone can benefit from. Now, I'm not an expert on the way art history is developing to incorporate a wider audience and more of a facilitator, but I do believe that art history needs to adapt from within and make being more accessible a key aim. And I think an immediate way going forward is going to be teaching digital skills to art historians working in academia, museums and galleries. We need to be transmitting ideas and theories on art so they can be heard, interpreted and most importantly, open to criticism from new voices, especially voices of those who have perhaps been left out from conversations in the past. Now, the future of art history should be extending the tools of seeing outwards, and that's what motivates me to help program content like you'll see tonight. Content that puts what art historians do at the forefront and invites others to either get something out of it or make providers of opinions to reconsider them. Essentially, the future of art history, I think, should be to embrace its importance, but to be mindful of the tone that it takes whilst it does so, and to be open to rejuvenation. We need to put ourselves out there, but we also need to take on board what we get back in return. And speaking of putting ourselves out there, um, please remember to tweet us at CourtAldRes with the hashtag, hashtag OpenCourtAldHour that's spelled H-O-U-R, not how my Scottish accent is pronouncing it, with your questions throughout. And you can also email any questions to researchforum at courtauld.ac.uk. That's researchforum, all one word, at courtauld.ac.uk. Now, uh, I've got the, the, the fun 
uh, pleasurable task of introducing our our first speaker tonight, Andrew. Do you want to pop your camera on now, Andrew? That should work. Hopefully you can see me. Oh yes, I can see yes. you now. <laughs> Looking lovely. Thank you, you too. Oh, thanks. Um, I almost <laughs> forgot there was 600 people watching there. I just thought we <laughs> Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to have you with us here tonight, Andrew. Uh, I'll just you. tell everyone watching at home that you're a PhD student at the Courtauld right now. And your thesis title is Strange Encounters in Contemporary Art from East and Southeast Asia, 1990 to Present. We're so happy to have you here because it's so important to have our student body represented when talking about the future of art history because you are the future. And we just kind of wanted to check in with you and and ask you a few questions about how the pandemic is affecting uh, you and your your research. So are you okay with that? Sure, yes, thank you. And thanks for having me on. Oh, really? No, thank you. <laughs> uh, so my, the first question I've got for you um, is, is, how are you adapting to, to researching in isolation? And, and what are you finding most challenging? Or is there even any positives coming from the situation at home? Hmm. Well, I guess the first thing that I'll say is that everyone is in different circumstances, right? And in my case, it's a mixed bag. In some ways, I'm very lucky. Uh, I don't have to juggle my PhD with caring duties. I live with housemates who I get along with. My PhD is funded and the money that I receive hasn't been uh, affected, that kind of base money yet. <laughs> um, and in my case as well, I'm studying contemporary artists who are very internet savvy, they have their own web pages regularly updated and the internet is a prime means of uh, accessing their work anyway, even if it's, you know, an installation or a sculpture or something like that. And um, so that's something I kind of have to um, deal with anyway. Um, and I think of some of my uh, fellow PhD students whose objects aren't digitized, who can only really work by uh, accessing their objects up close. And I think in some ways they're in a slightly more difficult position than I am. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to, I guess, some of the challenges, um, I think as a PhD, PhD student, a lot of the work that I do is independent and uh, alone anyway. Um, we don't have kind of weekly meetings or catch ups, for example, um, naturally built into our routines or the work that we do. Uh, and the work is also sometimes uh, repetitive as I'm sure you'll remember from your own PhD firm and um, sometimes you know I find myself hacking away at the same topic or the same chapter for months and months and months um, and so those are kind of challenges that I face anyway and uh, outside of lockdown I try and solve uh, some of those problems by for example varying where I work libraries cafes going to the court old PhD student um, office that we have and working next to other students. Um, and now I can't do that, obviously. So I've had to find other ways to um, connect with other people while being apart from them. Um, so for example, I've joined a reading group that somebody uh, kindly organized at King's um, over Zoom. And I've used um, house party to do study sessions with friends to keep each other motivated. Stuff like that. That's fun. You, you'll need to tell me how you did that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like, even now that libraries are, are closed, is that having a, a major impact on your ability to progress with your thesis? Yeah, I think generally it probably depends on where you're at in the research process. Um, so in my case, at the beginning of the lockdown period, I was finishing a draft of a chapter, which it's taken quite a long time, um, but it meant that I already had um, a lot of the material put together for that chapter. I managed to take out some key books and exhibition catalogues that I knew I wouldn't be able to access online. So I was able to finish most of that up um, fairly easily. And now I've kind of shifted gears and I'm researching a new chapter and it's a lot more difficult. Um, there are books that I can't access um, and obviously academic books are expensive as well. Mm. Um, some of them are available online um, and libraries have kind of, um, some libraries have invested in more um, uh, online access to different journals and stuff like that, um, which has been helpful. But yeah, it's, it's definitely affected the writing process. 
Oh, sure. Uh, thanks for that. And then finally, my last question is, um, I can imagine that the, the normal stresses of uni, such as financial stresses that you've mentioned, um, the feeling of being overwhelmed, as I well know what doing a PhD is like, it really makes you have an existential crisis, and the pressure to succeed um, and make your research relevant during a pandemic is, is heightened right now. Um, can you maybe elaborate on that? Um, sure. The, yeah, I mean, in, in my case, again, the research, the chapter that I was finishing up was actually about um, the body and uh, diseases and biomedicine and viruses um, and science fiction as well. Um, so in terms of making my research relevant um, or thinking about it in terms of um, what we're experiencing at the moment, um, it felt very real um, and not kind of not at all contrived and I definitely think you know there's the possibility of um, being a bit cynical and trying to make your research um, or thinking about it solely in terms of um, the pandemic um, and there's pressure to do that and I think generally as well um, there is pressure to be productive kind of in society and um, I think it's heightened at the moment uh, I've seen a lot of social media content that's revolved around using this time productively there's been an emphasis on self-development self-improvement learning a new language picking up a new skill or whatever and i'm sure that can help people feel better but i found it important to um be kind to myself um not yeah. kind of uh, limit my um use of social media in that regard um and not compare myself too much to what other people seem to be doing this time um which I kind of, I get again, things that as a PhD student, in order to avoid too much of an existential crisis, I kind of have to try and do those things anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I don't think what you, you said is just applicable to doing a PhD right now. Right. Sound like valuable life lessons we could <laughs> bring out of at this time. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's been a pleasure to see you. It's been so long. I know. <laughs> I know, it's so, so very long. And um, I'm going to hand back to Alex now uh, to introduce our, our next speaker for the evening. So thank you so much, Andrew. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. And, for, and I always think of Andrew's a Southeast Asian and I always think of him as uh, in flights coming kind of coming back from somewhere or, or going off to somewhere so it's strange to think of him incarcerated in a in a flat somewhere um, but great to see you Andrew and also your cheese plant is very much more luxuriant than mine um, but I'm not jealous so <laughs> um, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce Aviva Bernstock uh, a uh, professor of uh, conservation of art history and head of our Department of Conservation and Technology at the Courtauld. Uh, Aviva is um, very interested in the investigation of uh, materials uh, used uh, to make art and especially paintings and also um, the uh, characterization of materials and material changes. Um, so I um, am looking forward to uh, hearing her presentation. Aviva is um, one of the recurring stars of our uh, biannual um, research festivals and, and we're really pleased that she's uh, been willing to pop up uh, today and uh, and and kind of take the podium that uh, she holds so beautifully at our live event. So, Aviva, if you can switch yourself on and uh, and and share with us the um, the presentation that you prepared, that would be great. Thanks so much, Alex. That's very generous of you. I love I love the research festivals and I really love participating. You know, it's my favorite <laughs> to do the Courtauld. Absolutely, my favorite. So. Um, I'm going to talk about object-based study, which is something we're really suffering from at the moment because we can't go in and do it. But I have nonetheless gathered together some examples to show you, and I'm going to share my screen and talk you through it. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. oh, I hope you can see it. Oh, and I've got to put the full screen thing on, but I've got to find that there's something on the side. There we are. Okay. So, um, Technical imaging and object-based study of paintings is really not new to the history of art, but it has developed in the last few years, and that's partly due to the application of new scientific methods for looking at how paintings are made, together with an accumulation of a significant body of knowledge about the history of artists, materials, and techniques, which has really accumulated over about 100 years, quite a long time, so we've got lots to 
to think about now. So I think that this approach and the evidence derived from these sorts of studies will become more significant in exploring a range of art historical questions in the future. So it is relevant to this um, study. So in my nine minute slot, I'm going to show you a few examples of how imaging and close looking can highlight um, the hidden elements of an artist painting practice. So, um, first of all, um, X-radiography, for example, is a technique that's quite well known in the history of art and it was invented late, late in the 19th century and really applied to look at paintings very early on. And we can find out quite a lot about how an artist worked just from X-rays. And I think that most art historians are now quite familiar with X-radiography. In this example, um, you can see the use of lead white pigment or lead white pigment mixed in paint mixtures used for the flesh. Uh, the example here is a detail from Rubens Descent from the Cross from the Courtauld Gallery, uh, which is painted on a panel. And you can see that the areas that look light in the painting are where lead white's used in the paint in a kind of um, unconscious signature in the brushwork of an artist's hand. So an artist isn't conscious of how he or she uses paint, but in the x-ray you can see this pattern of use which may be characteristic of an artist, and it's quite important to see that. Um, sometimes we, we x-ray pictures and we find out some quite interesting and extraordinary things about them. Um, this is a, an x-ray of a kind of quite nice 19th century portrait um, on first glance, but we can see that in the x-ray that the painting is painted on a piece of canvas that was used and reused several times to practice painting hands. And then when we view it on its side, which I can show you in the next slide, we can see in the circle that another head was painted to the left and the sort of asymmetry of this and the thousands of hands that I think you can see in the painting um, would suggest that this piece of canvas was cut down from a bigger canvas that was then dis discarded and actually just used to practice on. And it's quite unusual to see such complex images in this way, but it's definitely a piece of practice canvas hidden under that 19th century portrait more sophisticated example of multi-spectral imaging in the infrared. This shows you a sequence of images um, of Gauguin's Nevermore, beautiful um, painting, post-impressionist painting, masterpiece from the Fourth Old Gallery painted in Tahiti in 1897. And with increasing wavelengths, uh, camera sensitive to increasing wavelengths, you can see that this painting was also painted over another image. Um, and as we progress through the images, I think you can see that it was painted over a landscape. And you can see these extra flowers and, and other elements in the, in the painting, including a, a mule or a horse under the um, reclining nude's belly, um, which is really only visible using this kind of multi-spectral imaging technique. Um, more recently, um, I have had the chance to look at this painting by Rembrandt, which is absolutely fantastic. The portrait, self-portrait with two circles, a late self-portrait, perhaps one of them, arguably the most sensitive of all of his late self-portraits painted sometime after 1665, which is in Kenwood House, uh, part of English Heritage Collection. And in fact, we x-rayed, we, not me, but the Courtauld x-rayed this picture um, in the late 70s. And at that time, it was very clear that um, the painting had actually changed quite a lot, that the artist had changed his mind about how he's going to depict himself. And you can see that his, I can't quite see it, but I think you can, and on, hopefully on the x-ray, see that his, his arm was raised to painting on an easel. But in fact, we found out a lot more just before lockdown about this painting. When I had the chance to go to Kenwood House, I'm wondering whether this, that can be moved. There we are. I went to Kenwood House uh, where we, they commissioned an infrared image to be taken of the painting, but you can see a great deal more uh, about the painting technique. First of all, you can see that there was an underdrawn area here where the, the brush was raised in the previous composition and the arm was painted over. And then in fact, his easel, his painting easel, was much wider uh, in the first stage of the composition. And in fact, he changed his hands around. So at the moment he's holding his palette, mold stick and brushes in one hand, but he was holding them in the other and that was painted out. And so in the final composition, you can see that the edge of the easel is painted here and much reduced. And then when you look closely at the painting, you can see in the infrared image on the left, 
quite fascinating um, to, to be able to see that Rembrandt drew perfectly round circles to locate the position of his eyes before working them up in paint. And these circles are curious or mysterious really because they mirror the circles in the background behind him that he painted last after the other changes that he made um, that lends its portrait its name. I hope you can see these perfectly round circles here which you absolutely can't see without an infrared image. And here's a picture you can see um, this is the way that the technique for the camera was situated quite far from the painting, which was carefully taken out of its easel. And this is in a, a very closed room at Kenwood House where it would normally hang. So it was a fantastic moment where it was an opportunity to look very closely at the painting and very close up, a very moving moment really, and also to, to do the technical imaging of the painting, which showed so much more information about it. Um, and I'm grateful to English Heritage for asking me to do it. And you can see on this side a detail of a hand and how really roughly the hand is painted. It's quite crudely painted, very rough, quite typical of his late work. But in fact, um, Rembrandt had quite great difficulties um, painting hands. And you can see in this painting in the National Gallery of Margarita de Geer, um, which was painted a couple of years before the, the portrait at Kenwood, uh, the sitter is uh, the hands are quite well worked up but you can see that Rembrandt had quite a few tries at painting the hands in the right position and getting them completely right. Now it's just possible that the sitter was there when he was painting the picture but he certainly tried very hard to get them right and when you look at the painting uh, in the National Gallery you can see how heavily worked they are. X-ray shows that even more clearly. But I think Rembrandt had a long history of not being able to paint hands which is pretty amazing for such an absolutely superb painter. You can see here in his early round self portrait that the painting in the final stage, the hand was completely painted out. You can see that in the x-ray, but not in the final picture. So he wasn't good at painting hands. So coming through finally to the 19th century, another fantastic um, painting, a post-impressionist painting by um, Van Gogh, a portrait with the bandaged ear painted in 1889. And the Courtauld also has a copy of the wood printed scroll um, that you can see in the background of this portrait. And it's a good example here of, of close looking at a painting that has told us something quite exciting about the artist's technique here. And that is that um, Van Gogh tried very hard to mimic the texture of the scroll, the paper, and you can see that in raking light here. And this is the canvas where the, the figure is painted. And what you can see down here, and that's the corner of the painting, is the white priming which in this detail under the microscope was actually scrubbed down and abraded to give the same impression as the paper of the scroll. So we tried very hard on a micro scale to get the, to mimic the effects that you would get on a paper object in his painting. Um, so really in conclusion, I hope you can get a sense of in this short talk of the challenges in interpreting evidence from technical study and can imagine that the development of new methods of imaging and material analysis of paintings might play a part in the future of art history. So, thank you. Aviva, thank you so much. Um, the first question is from uh, someone called, and I'm assuming this is um, uh, her passport name, Maja37256121. And she says, and I'm gonna try to decode her acronyms, but I might do it incorrectly. Do you think that art history has tools to work with and describe contemporary art, by which I mean art that's intertwined with technology, such as virtual reality, augmented reality, and works uh, by, an, um, for example, Team Lab? Do you know, I think that there's art that's made, I've actually seen art made like that in augmented reality, and it's very exciting to make you very dizzy. I think she's asking really um, if, if, the, if, if, um, if conservation and technology is engaging with, uh, with um, works on the kind of bleeding edge of the contemporary. Are people engaging with it? Well, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I'm really sorry. Because I mean, the, the, I'm sure that... Um, well, maybe, Aviva, maybe you could say something about your own engagement with, with acrylic painting, because you, your own research has engaged very much with um, the materials used by, uh, by artists, say, since 1960, 1970. I see. You know, I thought uh, that I would consider those traditional materials. I thought you yeah. meant internet, internet art and other sorts of art. 
um, which has a different kind of materiality, that's for sure. Um, and something, the preservation and how we sustain those sorts of works is, is always a big question. Um, but if, I mean, if we talk about things that are tangible, things that are made of something like acrylic or other sorts of materials, those are also things that we are, we have concerns about ways of sustaining the, at least the information about those works of art into the future and how to do that well. It may or may not be important to the artist, of course, but you know, do we remake things? Do we try and keep them as they are? There are those issues that we look at, yes. So I, ha I have another question at this kind of, um, kind of profound end of the spectrum, which is from Alex Horsley, who asks, as a student of art history, um, I fear our knowledge can feel outdated. So how can we adapt to the future, which will use technology, social media, et cetera, especially in museums, galleries, and heritage spaces? I think we're all going to enjoy adapting to the new technologies, which will surely give us a different perspective on how we view kind of traditional and non-traditional art. I think that they're increasingly creative ways of prompting questions, um, looking at, at things that are real in different ways and enriching our experience using different sorts of technologies. I can only guess at what might happen. It's hard to anticipate almost because things move quite yeah. fast. But um, yeah. you know, how do you see that? It feels like it's been it feels like that future has been brought forward to the right now in a kind of very kind of bracing way. I've got one last question for you, which is from at Dr. Project Doctor. And that question is, uh, sorry, I need to scroll. What is the most unexpected or surprising thing you've discovered when X-raying a painting? Okay. okay right. Or it could be any other technique. Let's just broaden that out. Any of the techniques that you use. Oh God, that's so hard. But the thing that springs to mind was, was the joke that a forger had played on us when we x-rayed a picture. It was quite a while ago when we, before we had a digital x-ray. Uh, we x-rayed the painting, it came in four sections. And when I stuck the sections together, it was, a, it was actually supposed to be a portrait by Holbein, somebody like Holbein. And underneath there was some writing. Oh, there's writing. When I stuck the x-ray together, it said, old masters for your Xmas gifts. So clearly, whoever made the painting had knew exactly what was going to happen to it. We were going to check it. It was a, you know, it was a it was one of Henry VIII's wives, I think it was, the portrait or something. But underneath, the forger had played a trick on us. They knew it was going to be X-rayed. They knew we were going to check it. And sure enough, it was an X-ray for your, it was your old masters, your Xmas gifts, written in lead white, so we could actually see it very clearly. On is, but I mean, that's the most that's, funny example I've seen. But is a brilliant story and one that I'm actually genuinely shocked you've never told me before. So thank you very much for sharing it with us this evening and, uh, and, and for welcoming us into your home. And so now we'll say good night to, assume, assuming that's your home. <laughs> um, you're going to say good night uh, for, to Aviva. Okay. And now um, hello from another uh, part of um, the vast metropolis that is London to Dr. Theodore Gordon. And um, I've been working uh, very closely with Theo uh, in his capacity as uh, our postdoctoral research fellow at the Courtauld, um, which he is this academic year. And um, Theo's research focus uh, is really on art made since about 1980, and especially works of art that respond to or made during the HIV AIDS epidemic um, in the 1980s. And he's also, uh, as I think you'll discover from his talk, very interested in, um, in queer art history history and queer theory. And this year, while he's our postdoc, in addition to growing the most extraordinary plants in our um, research fellows office, which are the envy of all horticulturalists at the Institute, he is researching the project Ecstatic Antibodies, Resisting the AIDS Mythology, um, uh, a 1990 uh, UK exhibition in response to the AIDS cure, uh, crisis that was curated by Tanya, Tessa Boffin and Sunil Gupta. And he's also programming a collaborative project for us at the Courtauld on art history in the time of climate change. And if that's something that interests you, you can tune in next week to our museum debate, where, which, is he, which he is chairing about that very topic. And you'll find him on Twitter at TheoGordon1 uh, and uh, on Instagram as well. Now, Theo, where are you, Theo? Can you pop up onto the screen 
now that I've um, introduced you and um, share with us your talk. Uncloak Hello. yourself. Hi, there talk you are. Hi, okay. Hello and goodbye, okay. I'm gonna disappear. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Um, so thanks uh, everyone for coming, everyone for organizing, all the fellow presenters and speakers. It's great to connect with people uh, who I don't know I'm connecting with. <laughs> um, coming to you from uh, East London, not far from Hawksmoors, St. George's in the East. Uh, so I've written something which I'm just gonna, um, which I'm just gonna read out, uh, which I hope is not gonna be too arduous. Um, so uh, in his lecture on the 30th of April, 2020 at Gresham College, the Chief Medical Officer for England, Professor Chris Whitty, explained how drug treatments, which are not the same as the development of a vaccine, might contribute to the contained management of this pandemic. He pointed out that, quote, most of the way in which we've dealt with the HIV pandemic is by using drugs rather than by using a vaccine. A vaccine has been looked for for a long time. We haven't yet got an effective one. We have got highly effective drugs, and this is the way in which we deal with this. Witty outlined three different types of drug treatments, antivirals, anti-inflammatories, and antibodies. Antivirals act upon viruses themselves at various stages along their pathway through the body. These have been effective at suppressing HIV in people able to access the drugs. Anti-inflammatories act rather upon the immune system itself, preventing an excessive immunoreaction to the virus that in turn overwhelms the body. It is currently suspected that certain anti-inflammatories may be important in reducing morbidity from COVID-19, as it appears that excessive immunoreaction in the lungs requiring oxygen and uh, in the worst cases ventilation is one of the key reasons why some people develop a more severe illness after a week with COVID-19. Third, we expect antibodies to COVID-19 to be present in people who have recovered from the illness and it should be possible to isolate from blood samples the plasma containing these antibodies and inject them into a person with COVID-19. The industrial production of these antibodies might then also be possible. I recount Witty's outline of these drug treatments as the hardly necessary reminder that the clinical strategies for tackling this new pathogen are by no means defined by a blunt understanding of fighting the virus itself as an invasive agent, but rather the careful multifaceted management of the body's environmental reactions to it. We know that this complex conception of treatment requiring rigor, expertise, and the investment of time and resources similarly applies to our ability to test and contact trace effectively to manage the environment around us as the only way out of the current blunt tactic of social distancing. Artistic and cultural treatments of the pandemic and its unequally experienced effects require similar levels of consideration, skill and effort. We know from the vast amount of scholarly work on HIV that our understanding of any particular virus is indissociable from its representations and cultural codings at the moment of its emergence in a political field which should, of course, caution against flippant comparisons of these two pandemics. I do, though, want briefly to share some insight from my research into the 1990 exhibition, Ecstatic Antibodies Resisting the Age Mythology, which uh, the Research Forum has very kindly been supporting this year. <laughs> so some insight into the ways that cultural production in the UK has in the past challenged the hegemonic narrative of a pandemic and sustained vital alternative visions of living. Ecstatic Antibodies was a group show of primarily photographic work curated by the artists Tessa Boffin and Sunil Gupta that was developed as, quote, an intervention in the cultural arena to examine the way AIDS has been represented in the media, the politics of representation, for example, in terms of the invisibility of certain communities, black people, lesbians, and gay men, and issues in government campaigns and mainstream media coverage. 
end quote. This was work produced by those people who were disproportionately affected by HIV AIDS, yet that had been denied the control of, or indeed any representation in the media. The exhibition opened at Impressions Gallery of Photography in York in 1990 and had an extensive tour, including Birmingham, Cardiff, London, Glasgow, Worcester, Montreal in Canada and Dublin, Ireland. In each location with an accompanying events program drawing in local health workers, artists and cultural activists, which is by the way, an interesting strategy to think in terms of the current vitality of regional and local public health networks to the testing and contact tracing that is so important to the overall national control of COVID-19. I don't have time to examine any of the works in ecstatic antibodies in detail, so I'm just going to highlight one aspect of one work from this exhibition, Rotini Fani Coyote and Alex Hurst's mixed media installation, Metaphysic, Every Moment Counts. The artist declared the aim of this project to, quote, produce spiritual antibodies to HIV, end quote, with Boffin and Gupta adopting the title of one of its individual photographs for the whole exhibition. The work is an alchemical hybrid of the iconographies of Yoruba mythology, Christianity, and contemporary gay SM cultures, creating playful images that ecstatically disrupt the fixity of any particular identity position. Fanny Coyote and Hurst frame the installation with two photographs of Rita Keegan, one of which I'm showing you here. The Caribbean Black Canadian artist who was born in the USA in 1949 and has lived in London since 1979. In tandem with her work in painting, textiles and installation, Keegan was a co-founder of Brixton Art Gallery in 1982. And in 1985, she established the Women of Colour Index, an archival project collecting slides of work by women artists of colour and collating press cuttings and, arting, and articles into individual files for each artist. This became part of the Women's Art Library in 1987, housed at Goldsmiths Library since 2004. Fanny Coyote and Hurst invoke Keegan in Metaphysic, Every Moment Counts, as an artist that similarly, quote, reassembles aspects of reality in the hope of stumbling upon true but hitherto unpublished stories of the extraordinary nature of everyday life. We are all of us denied access to physical archives at the moment. Yet Keegan's archival practice of charting and collating the artistic production of the marginalized offers one model for how cultural and art historical work now and in the future might resist and complicate simplistic hegemonic narratives of our current pandemic, most glaringly, most glaringly as a great leveler that supposedly affects us all equally. It is probably too early to tell if this crisis has precipitated a new period within and without the academy in which cultural work rethinks the stakes and boundaries of its archives. Nonetheless, it is interesting to note that with COVID-19, we seem to have moved definitively out of a time in which, in the words of Hal Foster in his 2004 essay, An Archival Impulse, artistically as much as politically, almost anything goes and almost nothing sticks. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Theo, um, for drawing in those parallels, like such difficult par parallels to make in such a a, de a dead topic. Um, I just I can't wait to sit down with you after the COVID times and talk more about your research and reality. We've got um, time for one question, if you're up for answering that. That's one that's come in via, via email. Uh, so this mm -hmm. one's from, from Linda McLean. Uh, I'm just going to read it out, sorry. Uh, what do you think about regional art spaces? Will they survive after COVID, seeing as though ecstatic antibodies was mainly hosted in regional galleries? Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, I, don't, I can't speak to how um, the fiscal arrangement for house spaces are literally going to survive. Um, um, but I'm sure it's, it's, it's not looking good uh, right now. Um, all I know is that regional work is absolutely vital and has one of the things that ecstatic antibodies um, demonstrates is that it, 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 it 
in, in there has been a time in the history of art in the UK in which that kind of regional engagement and the mixing together of artistic, cultural and um, uh, healthcare and the production of what well, the, the an investment in the improvement of quality of life through art in the regions designed um, designed for regional audiences for their the relevance of their lives. Um, and we can learn a lot from this project as to um, how to achieve um, how to achieve that or how to some strategies for how to work that through. Wow, um, great answer. I hope that answers your question, Linda. Uh, we're going to have to move swiftly on, so I'm just going to thank Theo uh, so much for sharing his presentation tonight. Thank you very much, Fern. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'll see you soon. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, now I have the pleasure of introducing our, our next speakers uh, from the Coral. So next up, we have Tom Bilson, uh, who is the head of digital media, and Faye Fournazier who is the Digitization Database and Cataloging Manager here at the Coralt. If you two want to unmask yourselves so people can see you, that would be great. Now through the Coralt Connects project, Tom and Faye are ensuring that our extensive photographic collections are available to everyone by the development of an ambitious digitization project encompassing 3.3 million prints from the archives, the Witten Conway libraries. Now these libraries form the, the basis of the collection, uh, the former of which serves as an essential resource for anyone looking for an in-depth history of Western art from 1200 to the present day. And it features original photographs, cuttings and published material on 70,000 artists, as well as the, the Laszlo collection of Paul Lave negatives, which documents paintings and sculpture by artists working in London between 1900 and 1950. So if you guys want to put cameras on. Yep. Oh, hi Faye, how are you? Hi. Excellent. Hi, hi Tom, how are you doing? I'm okay, how are you? Oh, good, thanks, yeah. Um, does one of you want to share your, your slides uh, to begin with? I'll start off with this one, here we go. Are we okay? Uh, I can't see any slides like now. You'll need to press the share screen bottom down. Well, okay. Underneath you. So it's a it's a green button. Yeah, hold, hold on, there we go. There you go. Yes. Way. Okay, brilliant. And then if you push the play button, you'll be good to go. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm going to leave now and just let you get on with it. So thank, thank you very Bye. much, Tom and Faye. Brilliant, thank you. Um, as Ben said, I'm Tom, I'm Head of Digital at the Courtauld, and Faye and I are going to be talking about um, what we believe to be a transformational project, um, as much for the Courtauld itself as also for public engagement in art history. As Fern said, we're, we're working on several collections. We are also concurrently engaged in digitizing the WIT library as well. But I'm going to talk about other collections and a completely different approach that we've got to digitization. So we mentioned the Conway Library, that's a collection of about a million images of world architecture and sculpture. We also have Tony Kirsting's archive around about 160,000 images documenting architecture across Europe, Asia and the Middle East. And also a collection, a fascinating collection of negatives by a photographer called Paul Leib. These are 22 glass plates. They were given to the Cordard in the 1970s, and they show uh, British artists who work between 1900 and 1945. And most crucially, it also shows a lot of photographs of artists at work in their studios. Um, it's very difficult to pick um, a favorite picture for the Conway, but I've picked four of them. Um, just to give you an idea of what the collection contains. On the left, we've got an albumen print from the 1860s that shows Westminster Abbey. Um, on the right, we've got a picture that shows the building of Le Corbusier's Chandigarh from a series of prints in the, in the collection. On the left, we have an image transferred from the Ministry of Works, 
very timely one that shows a Bastille Day service in France attended by American soldiers and townspeople against the backdrop of a ruined church. And on the right, this is one of Tony Kirsten's pictures, also taken in the 1940s, that shows an Ezidi woman taken in northern Iraq, in Kurdistan. Um, I'm going to pause at this slide because I'll say the court has had a really long-standing desire to digitize its collections. It goes right back to the kind of early 2000s. Um, but the challenge with this project was not so much to come up with a way of doing that, was to also to come up with a project that was exciting enough to engage with the really incredible Courtauld Connects agenda, but also capture the attention of a lot of possible funders and also appeal to an agenda about widening participation in art and art history. So we've done things like this before. We've taken collections out to contractors and they've done a really brilliant job for us, but we decided to do something completely different we decided to do it at Somerset House with a team of volunteers. And I'm just going to pause here and say that um, this project would not have happened without the incredibly generous trust and support of our director and also Stephanie Hall, who's running the Courtauld Connects programme. So a big thank you for them for really letting this happen and also letting it flourish within the Courtauld. So here are some of our team of volunteers. That's the old days when we could all group together. Um, I'll just tell you a few stats about them. Um, we started in March 2017 and since then 928 people have volunteered for us. Um, our actual active group of volunteers at any one time is around about 200 and these people have worked and they've actually donated 25,000 hours of time since we started. Um, they work in two to three shifts a day around about 12 to 18 people and our mantra that we always say to people is that we have no minimum skills and no minimum hours. So if you come to us, we will teach you how to do all of the operations that you need to do to make this project work. And very interestingly, around about a third of them have never heard of the Courtauld before. So they hear about this project through completely different routes. Um, we don't just work with our normal volunteers. Um, we've also worked with a corporate volunteering scheme last year. We've had 11 different companies come in to volunteer from us. Um, we ran 30, over 30 internships and work placements, and we ran partnerships with Terence Higgins Trust, um, My Action for Kids, City Lit, and One Housing. And my last site I'm going to show you is a partnership. It's a result of a partnership that we, are, we ran with a charity called Beyond Autism that help um, young people. It's an educational charity, and these collages are produced with um, reproductions from our collection and they now hang in the Conway Library. Sadly you can't see them at the moment but I invite you in to see them when we're open again. So I'll hand over to Faye now who's going to talk more about how the process works and um, how we work in the studio. So thank you Dom. Thank you. Um, so the next slide shows uh, one of our two digitization studios which obviously now we can't use. It's a space that we made uh, with the volunteers in mind and in fact um, the volunteers were involved actually in clearing the rooms so they really feel like the space is their own. Um, we offer photography, cataloguing, transcription of the ledgers that we have, conservation and collection care um, and the volunteers come in with no experience uh, but we get them up and running in hours rather than days which is something very um, very different from what um, they can find elsewhere. I think this is something we're very proud of and it's something we worked very hard to get to. Um, so the next, the next slide is a screenshot of the software we use. Uh, it's Capture One Cultural Heritage and um, in the loop circle you can really see um, why we photograph rather than scan. Um, we want to show the physical integrity of the archive and you can see the shadow of the objects that are glued to their mounts um, and the texture of the paper and as, as well as obviously really excellent detail uh, with the quality of the images that we're getting. Um, in the next slide, um, we have something fun that we're doing. So. Um, COVID-19 means we can't use the photographic studio, unfortunately, and we can't do any of the activities that we normally do uh, at Somerset House. Uh, but since we closed on the 18th of March, 
the volunteers have actually logged 876 hours of activity from home, um, which is amazing. And obviously we couldn't predict that. Um, so we keep, on Slack, uh, we keep in touch on Slack daily. We have Zoom meetings a couple of times a week. And we run a very much loved art club that you can see um, we have prompts for each week. Um, our volunteers are also working on transcription from home though. We're continuing on the aims of the project and they're also creating Wikipedia biographies uh, for the 400 photographers whose work appear in the collections. Um, they are producing audio transcripts, uh, of, well, audio recordings even, of the blogs that they write for the project um, uh, to make them more accessible. Uh, they're also contributing images from the collection to Layers of London um, and they're helping us test our new Zooniverse project, which is called World Arch Architecture Online, which will crowdsource the transcription of the first 10,000 items that we've uploaded. Um, so yeah, a new challenge will be continuing to provide this level of online engagement, which they all love when we reopen the physical um, activities. Um, yeah, we're also always keen to document the project because it moves so fast and it's always developing into new activities and new strands of the collection. So um, we now have the wonderful film team created by the volunteers who have these incredible skills um, and they're creating short films to showcase the collection and the stories of the volunteers uh, that form our team. <laughs> I am Irma Del Monte. Uh, I am an architecture historian from Venice. Um, I've been volunteering at the Courtauld Institute of Art for one year. I was really surprised when I found a picture of 100 years ago of a library where I used to study when I was in high school. What struck me in the picture was, rather than the architecture, that of course is really nice, um, was the intimate ambience. It showed me such an insightful um, atmosphere of a city that nowadays you can no longer see. Finally, um, what makes this project really special, as well as the volunteers, is the enthusiasm of the team that we have. Uh, we're very lucky to work very well together. So I should thank Caroline Chestnut, which is our volunteer manager, and Fran Olfrey, which is a volunteer assistant, and also Victoria Bennett, who's the digitization assistant, Mark Long, who does conservation and collection care for the photographs, and obviously Tom, thank you. Guys, thank you so much for this and also for sharing such wonderful images. I know that the, um, the, the photo with the fish is a, a, a favorite of, of many uh, Courtauldisti who are in the know and it's great that uh, the fish photo photographs and its companions are going to find a wider audience. We have time for just one question from uh, Dr. Fayumi who asks, I think a question that you'll rather like, which is, um, I know you've been thinking about it a lot, which is how has working with volunteers on this project changed your thoughts about the photographic collections? Tom, do you okay. want to take this? Um, I think it's made us realize that, um, that, you know, whether you want to use them to plan a holiday, whether you want to use them for kind of, um, for, you know, to research into family history, whether you're very interested in, in just the techniques for the present. I think, it, I think the, the various interests that volunteers have um, really kind of sparks, sparks our, our own interest in the collection. And I remember once somebody said to me, I, I remember walking through the National Gallery with a member of staff there, and I kind of said something too loud. I remember I shouted or said something. And they said, oh, don't worry, the paintings don't mind. And um, I think it, was, it might have even been a reader that said this to me when she worked there. And that really kind of struck home with me. And I think I've, so, I've realised that these photographs, they just sit in the boxes. And, and as long as somebody has a reason to be interested in them, then we're happy to, to go with that and run with that. Well, it's, um, I think, one of the most inspiring things that we're doing uh, through Courtauld Connects. And I, I say this to you personally, but it's nice to say it more publicly as well. And it's also great to see you both because, um, uh, yeah, we've yeah, drifted apart since the lockdown. So uh, now we're going to hand back to Fern, I think, for one last time. Hello, Fern. Hello, I'm here. 
Wow, that hour has gone quick, hasn't it? Okay, so uh, I have the, the privilege of introducing our last speaker for the evening, who is uh, going to do a poem for us. Uh, this is Munira Pilgrim, who is an international poet, writer, and cultural producer living between Bristol and London. She is one half of the Muslim female duo Poetic Pilgrimage. Munira conducts expressive based purpose driven workshops in women's groups, community groups, schools, universities, campfires, and as she puts it, wherever humankind commune. And you can follow Munira on Twitter at, at MuniPilgrim and also on Instagram. So if you would like to uh, put your camera on, Munira, and get ready to go. The work that Munira is going to be responding to is Allegory of Divine Love, uh, 16, that was done in 1664. And that's by Antonio de Castillo y Saavedra. And this is one of our own images. So Munira, if you just want to share your screen now. Okay. Oh, there we go. And there's the picture. And thank you so much for doing this. I'm really looking forward to this and I'll catch up with you later, but thank you. Okay. Bismillah, bear me one moment, sorry. My internet has gone, oh, here we are. Okay, Bismillah. It was said, everything in creation is a sign, a flagpole pointing towards the divine. The subtle, the kind, the merciful, the sublime, the first, the last, the hidden and the unseen, pointing to the most great, the most supreme. What is the sky if not a poem? Clouds if not pages from this poem? What are birds if not words flirting with pages, skirting on the verges of verses, transversing between sky and poem, nomad and knowing, knowing that these are all poems, elaborate love songs scribbled on air. These are poems blustered like lint, the type that will embed, embed hot in your chest, breathing hope like oversized balloons, hope for a new day, hope for new ways. We hope the cuts and grades of our past will not keloid our present. But those with an ounce of soul in their breath and no one in their hearts can read these signs. They are seers, they are mystics, they are my guys and medicine women. Rabia El Adawiya, Nana the Maroon, they are working night shifts to make ends meet. They are bowing their heads in prayer. They are adding water to ensure the food stretches a little further. They are cloaked in human form. And they can make believers out of cynics, wingtip fleeting through the sky, fleeting through tales told and untold and yet to unfold, from Fajr to Maghrib, Maghrib to Cordoba, pink to blues, blues to red, red to black. The browns of my lids prevent me from seeing what a miracle is. When waning hearts incline to the dark side, when we want to retreat into our mother's womb, though we can't remember, it feels like there may be comfort in the fetal. I can't feel my vitals. I have all of the answers to questions no one asks, the solutions to problems we do not have. The truth is a hard pill to swallow and an even harder pill to follow. In these times, we must learn to look. In these times, we must learn to look to women with insight in their eyes, pointing to the skies with child by side. These wise women who carry prophets in their bellies, and when they are born on their backs, little is said of them and their rahma, and the fact that God's name is literally the circumference of their womb. And that's left, all that's left is faded sketches drawn on paper. And that too is a sign, but little do we know. Thank you. Munir, that was incredible. And Matt, you light up the, <laughs> the Zoom screen. It's, it's quite hard to kind of own it that way. So like, I envy you and that was really stirring. I, I mean, the, ha the, ha the hairs on my arms are still standing up. So thank you so much for a beautiful ending to our uh, session on the uh, the future of art history. And I personally am um, pretty sure that the 
the future of art history is partly through poetry and, mm. uh, and other kind of creative enterprises. So thank you for that. Now, we are calling this the open courtyard hour, and sometimes it's like the open courtyard slightly more than an hour. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up uh, quickly tonight by thanking everyone who's contributed, Aviva, Fern, Theo, Tom, Faye, and Munira, and to thank our audience for, for joining in and, um, and to say that next week's uh, episode on uh, women and art history co-hosted with uh, the phenomenon that is Katie Hessel has already sold out, but it will be uh, waiting for you uh, on, uh, on our YouTube channel and on our website uh, on Friday next week. And this episode will be available for you to share with others and to maybe rewatch it if you want to um, uh, tomorrow premiering at 3 p.m. And uh, um, please get in contact with us um, at Courtauld Res on uh, Twitter and Instagram. And do use the hashtag uh, Open Courtauld Hour so that we can pick up the conversation. And um, before I sign off, I'm just going to say that um, one of the things that uh, I'm really proud to be associated with is our public programs courses that we run at the Courtauld. Um, we've kicked off a, a very successful and now sold out a series of lectures on on the art of California, which is currently running. And, and we are also either just have or uh, are just about to launch our uh, summer school, which is a hugely popular live and in person. And, and this uh, summer, our summer school is gonna be online. So if like uh, many of us, you're, you're craving kind of deeper nourishment and a more sustained engagement with the history of art, do visit our public programs page. And with that, um, enjoy the rest of your Thursday. And uh, we hope to see you uh, next week or at some future Open Courtauld Hour. So good night, everybody.